Welcome to chapter 17, Arthritis and Joint Pain. Arthritis is a chronic disease affecting joints, muscles, and sometimes other body systems. Because of the pain and disability, arthritis is the leading cause of impaired functioning in adults and affects um, about 52.5 million Americans. There are more than 100 forms of arthritis, though the most common forms are osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, and the spondyloarthropathies. Osteoarthritis is, prim is primarily a joint-specific uh, form, while the others are systemic and affect more than just the joints. Although even osteoarthritis has some systemic inflammatory responses. The most common symptoms of arthritis, regardless of the type, are gonna be stiffness, joint or muscle pain, and fatigue. Many people choose to stop exercising, believing that the activity might make the pain worse or speed up the degenerative process. However, proper exercise decreases pain and exercise does not actually speed up joint degeneration. Rather, it helps maintain normal function within that joint. There are various causes of arthritis, including trauma to a joint, abnormal biomechanics, or repetitive joint stress. These activities can damage the articular cartilage, which is the covering within the joint that absorbs stress and helps to smooth out motion. As the damage progresses, that joint space starts to narrow and the underlying bone um, and the bone underlying the cartilage starts to experience some abnormal stresses and then deforms over time. However, for some people, there is no identifiable cause for their arthritis. And with the systemic forms of arthritis and um, an abnormal immune system response is often the cause of joint destruction. Some of the risk factors for arthritis include age, sex, um, females are at a higher risk for most types, overweight and obesity, meaning increased weight can actually result in increased stress on the joints and therefore can also alter the biomechanics. Any previous injury, like joint injury specifically, um, Joint injuries are usually going to cause long-term changes to the joint surface and then lead to the development of arthritis. Occupations, so jobs that require sustained positions or repetitive motions, are going to place increased stress on the involved joints. So if you think of any like factory line work, manufacturing line work, where they're just doing the same thing over and over, and it doesn't always mean that they're doing it in the best um, or the most proper mechanically um, in the most mechanically proper position. Uh, smoking, this is also a, specifically a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis and can lead to complications following a joint replacement. And usually arthritis is going to be self-diagnosed during the initial stages and most people aren't going to go to the doctor until the pain or perhaps even loss of motion start to limit their activity. And then when they do go to the doctor, the diagnosis is done by correlating a health history and a physical examination to x-ray and various laboratory, uh, laboratory results. The two most common forms of arthritis are osteoarthritis, the one that you guys are probably most familiar with, and then rheumatoid arthritis, which I'm guessing many of you have heard about. 85% of arthritis cases are osteoarthritis. It is a local, local de degenerative joint disease and as much um, and most commonly affects the hands, the hips, knees, spine. One or more of the joints may be affected. Um, and then rheumatoid arthritis is going to be the second most common and it affects only 1 to 2% of the adult population, but it can occur at any age. The cause is unknown, but risk factors include age and being female. Rheumatoid arthritis is body-wide or systemic, as we've been referring to, and it affects tissues throughout the whole body. Similar to what occurs with um, osteoarthritis, the joints can become deformed and motion starts to become very difficult. Two other common systemic conditions are fibromyalgia and the spondyloarthropathies. Fibromyalgia is an arthritis-related condition found more often in women than in men that causes a widespread muscle tenderness. So with fibromyalgia, there's numerous tender points and they occur in various places such as the neck, shoulders, back, hips, arms, and legs. And then while there are several uh, forms of the spondyloarthropathies, this is an overall arching category, Ankylizing spondylitis is the most common, and this condition causes severe back pain and then eventually 
it can cause complete immobility of the spine. Maintaining an appropriate body weight really decreases the risk of developing arthritis, and it also helps lessen pain if you already have arthritis. Experts speculate that decreased weight results in less force to the joint. So if you're overweight, you can use exercise and proper nutrition to control your weight. A loss is as little as um, 10 pounds has been shown to decrease the pain associated with arthritis. Fish oil, which contains omega-3 fatty acids, has been shown to reduce the pain associated with arthritis. In several stu studies, people were able to reduce the amount of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or other medications they were on when they started to consume fish oil. The recommended daily dosage is 3 to 8 grams per day. This is usually going to be divided into two, two or three day doses. Additionally, flaxseed contains both omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, but research related to arthritis has been limited and there are still some side effects. Um, for example, flaxseed can alter the absorption of some medications and it also thins the blood. So this one would be important to check with a physician prior to consuming. A proper exercise program can diminish the associated pain and disability. So decreased muscle strength and joint motion often result in functional limitations and disability. Regular exercise improves strength and joint motion, thus improving function. Additionally, some studies have shown that even low-intensity exercise slows the progression of functional loss, although more intense exercise confers even more benefits. It should be noted that more intense exercise does not actually speed up joint degeneration or worsen the symptoms as long as the person kind of progress their program gradually and is continuing to protect those joints. One problem um, those with arthritis face is flare-ups or periods in which the joint swells than it would normally and the pain is worse. These are more common with systemic forms of arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis. And during a flare-up, a person may need to alter their program probably by reducing the intensity or temporarily eliminating a specific activity if it um, makes this, those symptoms worse. Another concern is joint instability and laxity. As the joint becomes more degraded and the joint space narrows, the tissues that normally stabilize the joint become a little bit more slack. When this happens, there's no longer um, they're no longer able to properly control the joint movement. So a person may need to use a brace and, or provide stability in a different manner in order to make sure the alignment is there, if, especially if engaging in activities that stress a joint that is prone to laxity or um, is experiencing some instability. Aerobic fitness is often lower in people with arthritis than in those with a, in, of the same age without arthritis. And we can probably read into this that they are probably going to be less active than those without arthritis just due to pain and um, being uncomfortable and thinking that perhaps exercise is going to make it worse. But not only does aerobic exercise improve circulation to the muscles and joints, uh, the rhythmic nature of the activities helps to lubricate the joints and provides nutrition to the joints, thereby decreasing pain. Moreover, exercise is one of the easiest ways to reduce stiffness associated with arthritis. It is recommended that if a person has been doing much physical activity, they should start, or hasn't, hasn't been doing much physical activity, they should start at a lower intensity. And this is true for all cases, right? Arthritis or not. So lower intensity, such as two to three, 10 minute sessions a day, so breaking those sessions up and this really is going to allow those joints to get used to the increased activity and kind of acclimate to this activity. Although walking is the easiest and most functional aerobic activity, if a person is a runner, there's no reason why they should give up running. Running does not increase the speed of the joint breakdown and many regular runners actually report less pain with regular training. If the arthritis is more advanced and a person has access to a pool, um, those aquatic activities are a great option to consider, although the cardiovascular benefits are not going to be as quite as good as with land exercises. Warm-up activities are particularly important for people with arthritis, especially with those who are very stiff. So before an exercise session, it's important to loosen up the joints and the muscles that are stiff. A good way to warm up is to do some gentle rhythmic activities, 
starting with small movements and then increasing the range of movements as they start to loosen up. The overarching goal then is just to control the movement with a slowly, with slowly increasing the range of motion. Resistance training may be one of the most important fitness activities a person with arthritis can do to really reduce symptoms and protect the joints. When there is pain around a joint such as the knee, the nervous system can also inhibit muscle contraction. And for many, this results in that knee buckling unexpectedly, or is and this is usually second, secondary to pain. After starting strengthening activities, people with this concern have less pain and fewer problems with their knees giving way. It's recommended that those with arthritis safely follow the resistance training guidelines presented in Chapter 6. A program of two to three days per week that emphasize all major muscle groups is important. A resistance that allows the completion of at least one set of 10 to 15 reps in a controlled manner is a good start and is also adequate for attaining some strength benefits. If, exercise is a, uh, if a person is exercising at home, they can consider using dumbbells, cuff weights, or resistance bands. And if not available, then simply use body weight as many of us would. Joint motion is usually lost as arthritis progresses, but regular stretching and range of motion activities can help slow this loss. Furthermore, if a person with arthritis does not move an involved joint, they may lose joint motion more quickly with an associated increase in pain. Although the recommendation is to do flexibility exercises three days per week, a person will definitely benefit from daily stretching and range of motion activities. Uh-oh, <laughs> apologize. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that, but something just popped up on my computer, so hopefully that didn't completely interfere. Okay, let's see here. Because arthritis can cause laxity in a joint, it's important to never actually hold a stretch beyond what is considered normal for that joint. And several factors affect that response to stretching. So with age, we know that muscles tend to lose that elasticity, which means that the tissues aren't going to respond as easily to stretching, even though much of stretching, much of the stretching response is, is neural in nature. However, a person can improve their response uh, to stretching by warming up properly prior to, and moreover, staying hydrated is actually important because dehydration decreases the elasticity of muscles. A typical result of arthritis is the loss of proprioception. And remember, this is that feedback uh, to the brain regarding joint position and motion. So again, where your body is at in space. The loss contributes to the instability noted earlier. And neuromotor training addresses joint proprioception and includes activities such as agility, balance, and other activities that are going to stimulate the feedback with, between the muscles and the brain, making them communicate. Although general guidelines suggest two to three days per week, a person would definitely benefit for, from more frequent uh, activity and engagement in neuromotor training, such as five to seven days per week. The goal is to include controlled movements throughout a joint's range of motion with limited impact on lower extremities. A good example of this is Tai Chi, and this is um, a good activity to train the connection between the nervous system and the muscles, and it really addresses all necessary components. Because neuromotor training is the most distinctive component of the training program as a whole, um, a sample is provided here in figure 17.4. As a note, for someone whose knees give way frequently, they may want to start balance and agility activities in the pool and kind of remove the influence of gravity on the joint and decrease the change of the knee buckling while doing the activity. And also, if you think about someone doing some balance activities who are incredibly unstable, um, it would be, or unstable, it would be important to use the pool environment instead in case they were to fall, lose balance, and we don't have to worry about them falling and um, landing on the ground, for instance, because we know those with arthritis are also going to be a little bit at a higher risk for a fracture as well. Acetaminophen is recommended for people with mild to moderate pain due to arthritis. So the most common, though still rare, side effects are gastrointestinal bleeding and liver damage. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are the next type of medication to help control the pain. 
The strength ranges from medications that are available over the counter, such as aspirin and ibuprofen, to stronger forms that require a prescription and have different modes of action within the body. And just as a side note, it actually just came out that they've created a new drug, which is a combination of Tylenol or acetaminophen and ibuprofen. So for individuals with arthritis, that might be a great option to look into. As with acetaminophen, GI bleeding is a possible side effect with the NSAIDs. And um, if a person has a system, a systemic form of arthritis, they are likely to be taking something called the DMARD, which is a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. Or a, um, they could also be taking a glucocorticoid, which is a steroid, or some sort of biologic drug. And possible side effects include key damage or kidney damage. Um, and with the steroids, the risk for infections becomes a little bit higher. On the plus side, these drugs are effective for pain relief and slowing the associated joint deterioration. So the only thing I really want you to be familiar with here um, is that these are possibilities. And specifically, if we're looking at maybe more osteoarthritis, just trying to manage that pain, we're looking at acetaminophen or an NSAID. Whereas if we're looking at more of a systemic type of arthritis, perhaps rheumatoid arthritis, then an individual is probably taking a DMARD, a glucocorticoid, or some sort of biologic drug. This is um, just a table of, uh, it has a summary of the possible benefits and side effects of karma, those um, arthritis medications we were just discussing. Again, just be aware of this. I don't necessarily want you to memorize this, but I do want you to be familiar with what a DMARD is, what NSAIDs are, um, acetaminophen, just the terms in general, the different categories probably would be the most important. Not that you know um, the exact benefits and possible side effects associated with taking those. A few nutritional supplements have been shown to decrease the pain associated with arthritis and we've talked uh, briefly about these on the nutrition slide. I included the fish oil and also flaxseed on the nutrition slide, but other ones um, uh, have positive aspects that aren't going to necessarily, uh, that might be a better option, for instance, than taking a medication. They could be worth trying because of this, but one of the most common nutritional supplement therapies is a combination of glucosamine and chondroitin. These compounds are normally found in body tissues, and it is thought that increased levels might help to protect or even improve joint cartilage. And although the advertised promises are overwhelmingly positive, the research findings are varied. And so some studies have shown decreased pain for those with osteoarthritis, whereas others have shown that there really isn't any benefit. But if a person were going to try to take these, the recommended Daily dosage is about 1,500 milligrams for glucosamine and about 1,200 milligrams for chondroitin. And lastly, this is just looking at some more dietary supplements, so potentially risky supplements to watch out for. Ephedrine, or also known as ephedra, has been used in weight loss or energy supplements. Uh, kava, you kind of some, sometimes see this in tea. Um, kava tea, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it has been purported to produce relaxation and reduce sleepiness. Uh, Pro-hormones or herbal anabolic supplements such as andro um, stendinone, or I'm not even going to try to say the next one to be honest, <laughs> um, but some have been linked to heart irregularities, increases in blood pressure, seizures, and sometimes even just um, premature death. So those are things to really be considered prior to starting to take. And even vitamins and minerals can be toxic, toxic if taken in excessive quantities. We've talked about this in class before. So vitamins B6 and B12, if taken in excessive amounts, can actually cause liver damage. And vitamin C can cause stomach upsets and um, interfere with copper and iron status. So it is important to check with someone who is knowledgeable, primarily a physician, um, who is qualified to give information about a supplement before you try it. 
but there's also a website there um, looking into the National Institute of Health's Office of Dietary Supplements that can provide summaries of, of each of these. So just things to be on the watch for. A lot of people are looking for more of a natural way to deal with pain, not just in the realm of arthritis, um, but with many chronic diseases. There's a lot of supplements out there, a lot of them being pushed. It's really easy to walk into GNC and get sold on something very quickly. So before we do that, it's just important, or before your grandmother, grandfather goes into does that, it's really important to just really be aware of overall, what are we looking at here if we start to take a supplement? And is it really a better option than starting to take a medication of some sort? All right, um, that's going to wrap up chapter 17. I hope you guys have a great day and we will be in touch.